Damon Khan here for seconds out with esteemed writer Jake Donovan to talk boxing. Jake, sir, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Damon. Thank you so much for having me on, man. Uh, it's really a pleasure. Pleasure to speak to you. Fighters are never 100% when they step into the ring, but what about <laughs> boxing writers when they step to the paper or the, the, the <laughs> keyboard? Have you recovered from the arm injury? Are you back to 100% now, Jake? Yep, full strength. Yes, sir. Yeah, even lost a little bit of weight, too. Got back in the, back in, well, I guess my gym, my home gym, but, you know, back on the grind. And, yeah, I'm uh, yeah, I'm back at it, full strength. Really appreciate that. <laughs> good, good to see you back at full strength. Now, there's a load of places where we could start off first, but... I yeah. want to start off with the most recent thing. I just uh, checked your Twitter beforehand, and it seems like uh, my question here was, Adrian Broner, where does he stand right now? Well, it seems like that's now cleared up a little bit, Jake. What's the situation here? I, I mean, if ever there was like a press release that said, what in the actual F? I, I like I read this. I'm like, is this for real? It's like, <laughs> I'm like, yep, this is surely from Don King's office. So, yep, AB is back, I, I guess. He signed with a promoter. I don't know if this means he's going to get back in the ring, but... He, um, yeah, he was supposed to be with BLK Prime. That obviously fizzled out, as I'm pretty sure BLK did as well. I don't think they're coming back. You know, AB, he has to continue. So he, he signed a deal with Don King. I just, I, I, I truly don't know what to make of it. Um, Don King hasn't had a relevant platform in years. So never mind his own relevance. Um, this it, It's a strange move. But hey, if he's got money to, you know, to get, get AB in the ring at least once a year, then God bless them both. I just, I, I still don't know what to think of it, to be honest. We'll touch back on Adrian Bruno later on, but we'll go back to yeah. where I was looking to start. If, if fished, finally, officially, not the best kept secret in boxing, but the undisputed silver, super middleweight champion, Sal Canelo Alvarez, right. will defend his 168 supremacy against Brit John Ryder. Jake, what's the feeling about Ryder's challenge? Over here in the UK, John seems as someone who's he's done things the hard way, been in the end of rough decisions, and he's got the opportunity he deserves. A real win for boxing fans, that's the feeling here. But if you look at De La Hoya's position, his perspective, if that's anything to go by, the feeling in the US might be that it's a little bit of an underwhelming matchup. It's I would definitely lean towards the latter over here. Um, I'm not surprised by the reaction. I, I keep saying this, like um, just understanding the rotation. The WBO was adamant. They were going to enforce their mandatory by May of 2023. So they're sticking to their guns. Everyone who's saying that Benavidez should be next or whatever. Look, I, I, I get all that. You know, David Benavidez even realized he's not going to get Canelo in the ring. So that's why he went and, and pursued the Caleb Plant fight. Uh, there's people even arguing that Demetrius Andrade, you know, well, he's being ducked once again. It's like he could have bet on himself. It, John Ryder took the fight that Demetrius Andrade didn't want. I get that he let it go to first bid. He didn't like what he was offered. But he, he, that, he took every step that he took to get to that point. Demetrius Andrade has nobody to blame but Demetrius Andrade. So he could have positioned himself to where he could have gotten that interim belt and then put Canelo back in the position to, you know, claim that he's ducking him again because he would have been the mandatory at that point. John Ryder took that fight. John Ryder beat Zach Parker. John Ryder is fighting Canelo next. We don't have to like it. Yes, maybe Canelo is, quote unquote, cherry picking, pick, you know, taking on what he believes to be the easiest of the of the four mandatories that await him. But he's playing the game, you know, so. Um, it, it just is what it is. I, it's a fight that we all expected. As you said, it was the worst kept secret. So I'm perfectly fine with it. Um, I don't know what his next move. He keeps saying he wants to fight Bebo after that. I, I'm kind of in the Benavidez camp that I don't believe that fight is ever going to happen. Is obviously the fight I think that all of us want to happen more so than any of his mandatories. But, you know, he's keeping the line moving. I like the fact that he is fighting back at home in Guadalajara. So if you have a fight like this, that it is a bit, you know, underwhelming over here, at least, you know, make it a, you know, that that creates a new storyline that, you know, we now have the homecoming. It's his first time since he fought Cumberland's in Throne. I think it was back in November uh, 2011. So, you know, we're talking more than 11 years since he's fought, you know, the face of Mexican boxing has actually fought in Mexico. So, you know, I I, I like that angle of it. Um, I don't love that it's a zone pay-per-view over here. I think it's regular the zone over there. And now you can get it on Sky Sports. So <laughs> as we saw this morning. Um, so there's certain elements that um, I do like of it. It's just... You know, the fight is just kind of there. I'm not as sour on it as other people are, but, you know, I, I it's a reaction, I guess, I expected over here. You mentioned the future fights there of Canelo, and you may be feeling that the B-ball rematch is unlikely. Do you feel that's at both weights, that being at super middle and light heavy, there was a feeling that maybe Canelo might drag down B-ball to 168. I spoke to Russ Ambry, and he says he wouldn't want to see that fight at all. But I wonder how you feel, feel about that, and if that is likely at all. Um, if, if, if we feel that Bebo will come down to 168, yeah, 
I, I think Bivol's side is going to use whatever they can for leverage on their part. They, you know, if Canelo is going to say, I want to fight you. And I think Canelo was on record saying he wants that fight at 175. He lost at 175. He wants to get his revenge at 175. That remains to be seen. I think any concession that Bivol would have to make is going to cost Canelo. Or at least they're going to say, you know, if you want to fight us, you know, you're going to force this rematch and you want us to be on your terms, you're going to have to pay us a lot more money. So they do have leverage. They they won the first fight. Obviously, Canelo was still the bigger fighter. But Bivo can go fight whoever he wants. It's, you know, I know everyone wants him to fight uh, Art Beterbiev. That Beterbiev has his own mandatories. We just saw that Callum Smith is announced. And I got lit up on Twitter when I said, well, he might not get past Callum Smith. And, you know, <laughs> just let me have it. I'm sticking to that, damn it. I'm going to die on that hill. Callum Smith is going to beat Beterbiev. I'm going all the way in now. But um, so we're not getting, I've always said, I don't, I never anticipated the undisputed championship. So the, obviously the best option after that for Bivo would be Canelo. So it would be in his best interest to go in there and negotiate but he's made it very clear. It's not going to be the same terms that they agreed to in the first fight. And he has that right. So um, I, I do believe if the rematch happens, uh, that Canelo will go up to 175 and fight him. Sticking with the light heavyweights, this weekend sees uh, Zuda Ramirez take on Gabriel Rosado. Strong feeling that we will see Zuda come through that fight. And he's called out the likes of Yard, Bwatsi Smith. Uh, who is a likely option for Zerdo, do you feel? Um, so Boatsy, to my understanding, is high enough in the WBA where I, I obviously, you know, if, if you wanted the Bebo fight, he could have taken it. He has his own reasons for passing on it and signing with Ben Shalom and Boxer. Um, I, I can see Azuldo, uh, I, I don't know the relationship with, uh, I don't know if Golden Boy does much business with Boxer, but he's going to have to position himself, you know, back into a title shot. You know, like I said, better be a, the, the pathway is closed over there. So unless he goes maybe, you know, the WBO route. But that presumably would be like a fight against uh, Anthony Yard. So um, he can't go the same route as like we've seen it with Jaime Munguia. He got to a certain point and then he just started fighting guys just for the sake of fighting. And, you know, his, his reputation is in tatters right now. So Zuldo is going to have to he's going to have to fight somebody. He's not going to get away with fighting uh, too many Gabe Rosados. You know, look, Gabe is, is is a name, but he's a journeyman. He's way, way past his best. He even said after the Akhmadov fight, he was considering retirement. So guys who kind of retire and then unretire to move up and wait and then, you know, take a fight like this. Yeah, the, obviously expectations aren't very high. So um, I'm kind of curious to see what, you know, Zuldo's next move is after this weekend. Just based on what Golden Boy has been doing with its other non-stars, I, I just, I don't know, my hopes aren't high. Because like I said, the the names you mentioned, it's just, it's relationships that we don't really see Golden Boy, you know, entering very much so. Um, I, I see maybe like a stay busy year for Zuldo. How about the year in tow for Triple G? His current status is a curious one. As you reported, he relinquished his belts, maybe signaling that his time at the top is done. But then he emerges in the WBC rankings at number one with right. Jamal Charlo as the champion. Likely to see Charlo and GGG trade later this year? I, uh, this year, I, I don't, I'm not in a hurry to say that. I know Carlos Adamas is the interim champion. His team insists that they've wanted that fight. I mean, he's with PBC, Charlo's with PBC. I still don't understand why the WBC just didn't make Adamas the champion and Charlo the champion in recess and let Charlo go fight Adamas whenever he wants, if he wants. Um, so I, I do believe that that fight has to happen at some point. I don't know who Charlo is going to fight next. I can't, you know, people like, oh, you know, Triple G is number one. They can name him the mandatory and, you know, let them fight in June. I feel like that between him and then Jermel fighting Tim Zhu probably in July, that will completely blow Showtime's budget. So I just, I don't see that fight happening next. And God knows we don't need another pay-per-view. So um, I still don't know who Jermel is fighting next. I do believe he will fight Triple G. Um, I never understood why with when Triple G was in negotiations with Lara, like why wouldn't he just go to PBC and negotiate like a multi-fight deal that, okay, when you beat Lara, and I do think even at this stage of his career, it would beat uh, Arizlandi Lara. Then that would lead to a Jamal Chala fight, making a multi-fight deal with PBC. I mean, he's at the end of his you know career, just, you know, and make it like a three fight deal and then fade off to the sunset. He's going to get, you know, the money that he wants because otherwise he's going into these negotiations and he has a certain, you know, limit to where he thinks he's worth and he's just not going to get it, you know, as an independent. Mm -hmm. well, let's talk about a hot button topic. We'll stick with here for the moment that being Connor Ben in the UK, he can't fight here, but he right. can in the U S or elsewhere. It seems overseas. Speaking to Eddie Hearn, he's teasing this much talked about fight with Manny Pacquiao, also an American opponent in the mix. Have you heard much on who that could be? And is it likely anyway that this Ben Pacquiao fight happens? 
It seems like the Ben Pacquiao thing really has legs. I know Sean Gibbons has not made it a secret that they've been in talks for quite a while. Um, I, I've always felt like Conor Ben, when he returned, you know, as long as um, Matchroom is going to do this, um, the championship series out in in Abu Dhabi, that someone like Conor Ben would be perfect for that. I don't think he's going to fight in the U.S. I don't. I think if the U.S. is, you know, especially like Nevada, they're going to look at, you know, the what's going on, you know, with the British Boxing Border Control and be like, no, go take care of business over there, then get licensed over here. You're not going to use us, you know, to make, get in the good graces of the U.K. again, although they did kind of let Tyson Fury do that to a lesser extent. But um, I've always felt like um, that Matchroom can use that series to allow guys like Ben, who especially guys like Ben, who can't fight in the U.K., you know, he can, you know, make a career, you know, go fight over there, make good money. I I I don't know. I'm iffy if we're going to see Ben Pacquiao on June 3rd, but I do believe that is the fight he wants the most. Um, I know Kel Brook's name has popped up again that maybe we see something like that. And again, it's a fight that could take place over there. I don't know the commission standards, you know, with the, the Middle Eastern, you know, Middle East Boxing Commission, but I can't imagine they're as stringent as, you know, what it would require to do a fight like that in the UK. So I, I can't I think it's one of those two options. I'm not sure he fights a relevant American over there. If Ben was to continue his career and and have a fight in the US, how how well known is Ben in the US? I saw the like suspense interacting with him on Twitter, but does the US audience have that interest in him, especially with the current cloud over him right now? Uh, yeah, I do. I, I do. I, I believe that, you know, like I said, if he fights in, in Dubai and then could find a commission over here, I, I think a commission will license him. Like, I don't know if it'd be New York, Nevada or California. I, and, and you wonder like where, maybe he goes to Texas, who knows? But again, I can't imagine Conor Ben would come cheat. So he would kind of have to invest in himself to, you know, to to fight on a show like that. But they, I think there definitely would be interest, especially among the top guys. Um, but he is with Eddie. So like, you know, is Matchroom and PBC, are they going to go, you know, do business together? Because that would be his most lucrative option. I don't see him getting like immediately into the the Terrence Crawford business. That's, you know, we're talking about very expensive fights to bring him over into the U.S. But um, the, the top guys definitely have mentioned his name. They know who he is and they are interested in him. When it comes to Pacquiao, is it a full-blown fight? Is it an exhibition? I remember when Ryan Garcia was touted to potentially fight Manny Pacquiao. That was uh, supposed nice to be an question. exhibition, I think, wasn't it? So is it Pacquiao yeah. coming out of retirement here? He claims he is. And I think it, it, especially in um, Abu Dhabi, it would be a full blown fight. Uh, to my knowledge, it would not be an exhibition. Obviously, if the tag thing, if they even attempted the tag thing thing, you know, that would be a, an exhibition. But Floyd kind of poured water on that. I was actually more excited for that because, you know, you know, Manny Pacquiao and Saul Poppy, you know, on the same show, never mind in the same corner that that would get my juices flowing. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do believe that a Ben Pacquiao fight actually would be, um, you know, Manny Pacquiao described it as coming out of retirement. He didn't say he was coming out of retirement when he had his exhibition in Korea a couple of months ago. So um, to, to my knowledge, it would be a full-blown fight. And you mentioned earlier DAZN launching in the UK as a TV channel seems like a much-needed move to make right. a gain on the viewership market. Fight is recently leaving Matchroom for other platforms, most notably Boaxi, mentioning yesterday leaving due to a lack of eyes on his last fight. It's now on satellite TV or cable, I believe you call it in the US, but... Right. Do you feel like the zone's likely to appear on cable in the U.S. soon? Do you feel I, I, the, the first thing I did when I saw that, I contacted my, you know, my my main man at, at the zone. I said, "Hey, congrats! This is big news. When am I going to be able to do something like this?" They said, "Still in the works." You know, um, well, he said, "You know, it's not yet happening." Um, I, I, it's something that they're going to work on. I, I, it is. I love that option. Um, I see people already complaining though that, oh, well, I already subscribed to the zone. I get the annual pass. How come I can't get it on, you know, Sky? It's like, well, it's the same thing over here. I have like a subscription to Showtime external to my, you know, uh, DirecTV package. So therefore I can't get it on DirecTV, you know, because I'm getting the discounted price through the app. So, um, you know, I, I, people are just going to complain, you know, if they want to complain. This is obviously targeted towards those people who are saying, well, I don't want to download an app to watch this this channel. Well, now you can. So um, I, I do believe eventually if they see it's successful in the UK and Ireland, it will make its way around the world and especially to the U.S. Do you feel this is a move of strategy or a move of necessity? Um, I probably a little bit of both. I, obviously, it's not a ploy to get you know Boazzi to sign back with Matchroom. <laughs> I, although I, I do find it strange that if they knew about this, that they had it in their back pocket until after he said that. But um, yeah, I, I do think it's a combination of both. They know they they keep making their moves, you know, to to remain competitive in this market because you know obviously when they launched, you know, they said pay per view is dead, and we know pay per view is not dead. They realized in order to 
you know, retain the services of someone like Canelo or um, AJ up until this upcoming fight that they have to get in the pay-per-view market. So now with these guys saying, you know, they want to fight on linear TV, well, you know, now they have this option as well. So I do like that, you know, the zone is adjusting. I don't, you know, I, I hate when people are like, oh, well, you know, this is what you said, you know, five, six years ago. It's like, well, when PBC launched, they said, you know, free boxing for all. I still have the T-shirt at home. And obviously they had to make adjustments to make sure that they stayed afloat and relevant. And, you know, that's what you do. You don't just die on a hill. You know, you have to adapt to the business model. So I actually applaud the the move that the zone is making. Now, you talked about fight, uh, boxing fans, sorry, liking to complain about a few things. Hopefully, we won't be complaining about big fights being made. Fury vs. Usyk, look, we're getting a lot of the social media back and forth, although from Tyson Fury's part, he says he's staying silent now. Things are on the move, it right. seems. Uh, do you feel that we finally get some sort of move of an official announcement for Fury vs. Usyk? You know, I wrote the story last week that um, the WBA was going to order, uh, they, they had a deadline that if they didn't get confirmation that Fury Usyk was going to happen, that they were going to order Usyk and Daniel Dubois. I felt like at that time that the steps that Fury and Usyk took was just to buy more time. Uh, so if you ask me this question on Saturday, Sunday, maybe even yesterday, I, I wouldn't have believed the fight is happening next. I, I'm still skeptical that we ever see it. Um, I just feel like the two of them were talking and they knew that they had to take other fights. Um, the fact that Sugar Hill has now tra you know, traveled over to the UK to join Tyson Fury, that leaves me hopeful that he's at least fighting next. I still don't know if we're getting the Usyk fight next. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm just still, I, I, I'm a little more optimistic than I was yesterday, but I'm still not even at 50% that we're going to see it at least on April 29th. Jake, uh, you have been in boxing a lot longer than I have, uh, but I get a feeling that fights, or at least big fights, it seems like they're being made with as little notice as possible than they would normally. You get these it's five or six weeks notice now, whereas normally you get, yeah. you're getting months in advance. Why do you, why do you feel that is that it's maybe a trend towards that direction now? I guess they just don't, you know, they don't feel like the need to like they don't need they don't have to have this big build up that they used to, especially like, you know, using social media to their advantage. People at home watching on apps, you know, watching however they want. Um, you, you just don't have to, you know, arouse the situation. It, it's a little bit of a shame, but um, like we saw with, uh, you know, Ryan and, and uh, I'm sorry, with Javante Davis and Ryan Garcia, like the five months that it took to finally get this fight over the line, that was almost like the promotion to that fight. So, you know, they don't need that 12 week build up. It's like, well, we've been discussing it really since, you know, last September or last October, whenever they've been in talks. So we, you know, with Fury and Usyk, really, I guess the promotion kind of began when Usyk got on the ring apron, I guess not necessarily all the way in the ring, but when he got on the ring apron to, you know, get in Tyson Fury's face and, you know, let Tyson say whatever I had to say that the promotion kind of began then. So it is true that this fight can begin whenever. I mean, we saw it with, with Tank and Ryan, like tickets went on sale. They sold out immediately. So, you know, you don't need 12 weeks to sell tickets, you know, for some of these events. Fury's proven in his last two fights, he's still a massive draw in the UK. So this fight can go, I mean, obviously it has to, you know, get announced at some point. You can't just announce it, you know, April 15th, we're going to fight in two weeks, you know, here's all the tickets. But um, yeah, we don't need this big run up to these fights anymore. So th this, it seems like in the new market, they're getting away with announcing these fights seven, eight weeks out. I, I feel like with Fury Usyk, it's, it's a very tight timeline, especially like if ESPN is going to, you know, distribute it on pay-per-view. We're now talking about this. We got Tank, Ryan, we got Fury Usyk. We got uh, Canelo is the next week. There's like four pay-per-views in a, in a four five week span. Uh, if Spence Thurman happens, you know, whatever in early June or whatever, like now we're talking like there's a lot of pay-per-views all at once. That's why I don't even know if pushing out Fury Usyk, you know, a few weeks later, it's still a flooded pay-per-view market. I, I just feel like they're both going to fight someone else next. And then they're going to revisit that fight later this year. Do you feel like Tank Garcia, um, as you mentioned, that is the type of fight where it feels like amongst boxing fans, especially over this side, needs a big fight to really regenerate interest in boxing right now. Is that tracking interest-wise to be that big fight that generates that interest? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the two press conferences they had last week, they were trending for days on end. So, I mean, I obviously other things came up. It's like, oh, you know, now people are talking about this. People are still talking about, you know, th that fight. So this is, um, I, I'm maybe I'm overly optimistic. I think this is going to be the best pay-per-view we've seen in quite some time, even including, you know, Canelo Plant, which I think was the best selling you know legit fight you know never mind you know whatever side shows we have but i i think this is the one that has a shot at cracking a million even with you know piracy at all time high there's just that much interest in in this fight so it's definitely the one fight that's captured mainstream appeal i feel bad even for a fight like benavides and plant which i think is a fantastic matchup i wish it was on showtime instead of regular pay-per-view i think even without 
other pay-per-views surrounding it, it would might have struggled. Um, I, I think it's kind of getting lost in the shuffle even more so. They're doing a great job of promoting it, but there's still, you know, uh, Tank and Garcia is just, you know, completely dwarfing an event like that. So, but um, I, I do believe that, yeah, that that's the fight that, you know, really is going to uh, reel in the mainstream. Can you see? Can you say who you favor in this one? I was speaking to Shane McGuigan. Whilst I feel there's a strong feeling towards Tank Davis, he obviously mm-hmm. cornered Luke Campbell for his fight with against Ryan Garcia, and he said like, "Don't yep. count out Ryan at all. He's got a lot of heart. He's got the yep. will to win, and he's got that left hook which can really hurt his opponents. and And he's a, he's a, he's a strong guy in the fight. He's got his own things to say in this fight here. How how do you feel the fight goes? I've always felt like um, it's going to go almost like every other fight we see with Tank. And it, it's amazing that he finds so many different ways to knock people out. Like mm-hmm. he's a lot more, um, he, he's a lot more going around that, you know, he's not just the guy that, you know, knocks you out. I mean, he can knock you out one punch, but that's not his limitation. I, I just feel like whatever success Ryan's going to have at some point, Tank is going to make that ring a lot smaller. He's going to find, you know, I'm not saying Ryan has a soft chin by any means, but you know, Tank can knock out anyone. He's shown that he can knock out anyone. I, I think he's just going to make that ring a very small place like as the fight goes on, and he's going to find a way to eventually break him down and stop him. That's always been my hunch. I don't sleep on Ryan's chances at all, though. I think it's going to be an extremely competitive fight up until the point where Tank just, you know, immediately takes over. And then, like, the I, I think once he gets to that point, the fight just doesn't, you know, uh, go uh, turn back. Final couple of things for me. Uh, got now announced Katie Taylor versus Chantel Cameron. Katie Taylor stepping up to yeah. challenge Chantel Cameron for the undisputed uh, titles. It, it was potentially supposed to be the rematch with Amanda Serrano. Do you feel that's still in the offing here? Uh, I, I, I don't want to be down on it. I'm going to give a shout out to my man, Thomas Rohan. He promised me he was going to find the toughest opponent possible for Katie Taylor once Amanda Serrano bowed out. So Thomas, shout out to you for making that happen. I know it wasn't, you know, it's a team effort, but um, I, I don't know. Like a part of me feels like, I don't know if it was a now or never situation for that fight. It did ex- feel like extremely rushed. Like everyone knew going into the Serrano Cruz fight that, okay, Amanda wins, especially when Katie was made a point to be ringside for that fight. Like, okay, so, uh, Taylor Serrano too has to be next, but that was a brutal fight. Like once that fight was done, I'm like, ah, oh, man, maybe they should really delay this announcement. And then sure enough, you know, Amanda got told, you know, by her, she was ready to go through with it. She was ready to enter training camp. Her doctor's like, you got to rest for like, you know, six weeks. And she's like, no, I got to start training camp tomorrow. And he's like, no, well, no, if you're going to training camp, these injuries that you have are never going to heal. So hopefully it does happen later this year. Um, I think they saw that they still want to do pro park. Um, I, I just, I don't know, man. I just feel like that's, it was like a now or never situation for something like that. Like that, that fight would have been perfect for Croak. I understand that, you know, the, the exorbitant costs made that impossible. Um, I just don't know if that's ever going to come back and play. I think, I don't know if Katie's even playing with house money. I mean, cause she's moving up. So her undisputed lightweight championship is still going to remain intact. Yeah. And I think once it gets to later this year, look, Amanda's going to make a lot of money, um, you know, t- to fight Katie. She's going to make more to fight Katie than anyone else. So it's going to be a decision on her part. Okay, do I still want to move back up and wait to fight her one more time and then finish out my career at featherweight? Or do I just stay at featherweight and, you know, take on whatever challenges, you know, await her um, over there? So um, I, I, I don't know. It's tough, you know, with a, a dangerous fight like this for Katie, you know, Chantel Cameron is, you know, she's a pound for pound fighter, you know, and I don't think, I don't know anyone who's picking Katie outright in this fight. I mean, she's fighting the undisputed championship one weight up. I mean, she looked good, not fantastic when she fought Christina Lenardo to, to win, you know, the one belt. I, I obviously, you know, Chantel, I, I outside of Katie, I would pick her without hesitation to beat anyone, uh, you know, up to 140. Maybe Alicia Baumgartner might be the exception. I think Michaela Mayer could give her a good fight, but I would still pick Chantel with confidence over just about any other fighter. So um I don't want to look past May 20th. It, it's dangerous to talk about, you know, can we still get Taylor Toronto too in September when, you know, there's a good chance Katie doesn't even get through May 20th. Any any part of the wedge between Eddie Hearn and Jake Paul that maybe might have played something in the background between this fight being made? I mean, they're in, they're locked in a legal battle right now. Right. Um, and Serrano, she pulled out because of injury. Normally fighters right now, they post their injury uh, right. you know, proof there. Not saying that it wasn't legitimate or not, but I'm just saying that's the lay of the land right now. Any part of that you feel maybe played a wedge in this at all? No, I don't. I feel like if that was a wedge, like they wouldn't even have gone through with the rematch. Um, I, I get it. It's, you know, it's man is right, you know, to to demand that rematch. But no, I, I feel like if there was that rift, we wouldn't even got to this point. And Eddie certainly wouldn't have had motivation to allow 
you know, Amanda to even fight on, you know, the zone. So I, I get that, you know, Jake Paul bring, brings a certain amount of clout, but these were still, it was still a matchroom event that, you know, took place in February. So no, I, I think uh, they both recognize, you know, Jake Paul is not going to hold Amanda Serrano's career hostage. If she's going to want to fight Katie Taylor again, you know, he's even Jake Paul is capable of putting his ego aside to, to make a fight like that happen. I, I think he's proven that as a promoter, he's never stood in the way of, you know, doing what's best for his fighters. I always give him credit for that. Um, I, you know, I'm always grateful to him for, you know, the success that he's brought, you know, Amanda and her family. I, it's no secret. I'm very close with them. So to, you know, for her to go a career to go from like five figure paydays to, you know, where she is now, which, you know, buying a house out outright, that's all, you know, credit to what Jake Prawl has brought to her career. So I think he's always had that sense. He's not going to do that damage to him. Like if she still wants this fight, you know, he, he's going to do it. He's got to settle up his, his legal business with Matchroom. But no, I don't think that played a part at all and why we're not getting that fight in May. Last thing I want to touch on, and after this interview, I'll be jumping on from talking to yourself to Jack Manifold, he, who features on a Creator Clash card. This is the YouTube social media influencers star card. You mentioned about a tag team fight with Salt Papi and Manny Pacquiao. <laughs> this was a recent, quote unquote, innovation in boxing. Uh, it was received quite well in some parts of boxing. Where do you stand on it? Uh, look, as far as like all that stuff, it's it, obviously these aren't fights that count. So it's it's weird because you have to um, like I even thought like with, you know, Floyd and KSI fighting Manny Pacquiao and Saul Pop. It's like it's not even it, I guess it's a tag team, but it, there's not like at some point, you know, Manny's going to be in there with KSI or Floyd would be in there and Saul Poppy. So it's like, you know, you have to have like four cruiserweights, you know, four guys around the same way to make that happen. Um, it's all sideshow stuff as it is. So, look, if, if the fans who are already watching that stuff or entertained by it, I, I, I'm perfectly fine with it. Fair enough, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know what else to say about it. I mean, look, I, I look. if Jake Paul and Logan Paul could fight KSI and Saul Poppy, and that's the only way we're going to get those guys, you know, in the ring together, you know, I, I'm all for it. So, like like I said, if you're already buying into the sideshow stuff, you know, why not just, you know, sit down and embrace whatever entertains you? So, I, I, I can't. I'm not going to hate on it. Is there a danger, though, that this takes more of the eyes over the boxing world or like, you, you know, the broadcasters have more interest in this than the actual boxing right now? It feels like there's been a lot more of this cropping about. So I don't see misfit boxing like taking away dates from anyone. So that's where I'm fine with it. I've always like, look, I was very resistant when the whole, you know, YouTube movement came like, why is Logan Paul and, and KSI, you know, on the zone? But it's like, it's not a date. It's like, okay, well, Golden Boy had this date, but we're taking that away. And we're, now we're going to give it to these guys. So in that sense, I, I'm perfectly fine with it. Like people talk about, you know, Jake Paul headlining pay-per-views, you know, it's disrespecting the guys who put in the work, you know, fought in the amateurs for years. It's like, well, those guys aren't at the pay-per-view level. Yet. So they're not taking away slots from anyone. So, you know, it, it, it's fine. Like it's a lot of it is pay-per-view anyway. So you have the option to not watch it. Even if it's just on the zone, you have the option to not watch it. Like there have been very few events where like it's like while that's taking place, something else in boxing. We have so many, you know, fights coming up. There's so much on the schedules. Like you have the options to just skip that and pay attention to something that's more relevant. So like when KSI fought in England, I, I interviewed him, you know, his manager is from my area and I knew that the tour was eventually coming to Nashville. So I did want to, you know, watch it and have a frame of reference, but there was nothing else going on that day. So I said, all right, let me just tune in. But for those who are just resistant to it, just don't watch it. It will continue to split opinion, yeah. Jake. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Let me say this one more thing, too. It's like you watch a movie about boxing. Like how many, you know, if you pick 10 boxing movies, I would say at least nine of them is going to involve some form of corruption. Like in all those movies, they think there's some guy, you know, in a smoke screen handing over a bag of cash saying, all right, this guy's going to go down in the fourth round. People still believe that, but that's always the stereotype that follows boxing. So I kind of equate, you know, all the sideshow stuff to that. Like the people want to believe the worst, you know, they're going to, you know, find a reason to complain about that. Fair enough. Yes, it will split opinion amongst boxing fans for sure. Uh, Jake, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Where can we find more of your musings, your writings? Uh, and if we want to follow you on social media, where can we find you? So on uh, mainly on Twitter, uh, at Jake and the Box. And then all my stuff is on Boxing Scene. Uh, I also do uh, contribute to Bet365 on occasion. Yeah. So, uh, But yeah, mainly on Boxing Scene and Twitter if you want to find me. And hopefully again on seconds out very soon. Yes, Jake. anytime you guys want, Eamon. Anytime, man. I was, I was like, I know you, you like to do the rotations. Like I, I, we did this once. I'm like, ah, man, this is probably the only time I'm going to be on here. So it was a pleasure to be back. You know, this time and yeah, anytime you want me back on, I'm always happy. No, it was real good speaking to you last time and again this time, Jake. Thank you so much for speaking to seconds out. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure. <laughs>